Welcome back. Those of you that are paying attention are noticing about now that I've changed the background map on you and I've moved the title from the top of the bottom to the bottom. It's very observant of you. Last time I talked about buffer and vector overlay which are operations, geoprocessing operations you can perform on your data to actually extract pieces of your data and even new geometry from your data to answer questions about what or how or why your data behave the way they do. Here's a little review from maybe module one where I said that learning GIS is like learning to speak a foreign language. I also had this kind of hierarchy of things that are similar between GIS, learning GIS and learning a foreign language. One of those is GIS workflows are like sentences and paragraphs. So for the most part so far we've been working a lot on terminology and concepts the vocabulary and the grammar of GIS. This next couple of videos talks a little bit about putting together these concepts using the grammar and the vocabulary to create what are called workflows. And workflows are kind of like sentences and paragraphs when you're telling your geographic story. So I'm going to talk about a few different types of workflows that you can use and then some basic sentence examples that you might think about. Okay, sequences. A workflow can be thought of as a sequence where you start with an input layer, you do something to that input layer, creates a new layer, you do something to it again and you create a th another new layer and you go through sequentially from start to finish ending up with a final layer that uses the input as its source but the operations to transform the data in the input layer into information that you can use in the output. That's a basic straight through sequence. Sometimes these sequences can branch or combine. So in this left example, you've got one data layer that you do three different things to, and you create three different output data layers. In this one, you take two input data layers and you do something to those two and make a third. So this might be an example of overlay from the last video. Data doesn't have to all be spatial, and that's all about what the joins and the relates are all about. You can join data to non-spatial data and create new spatial data that contains data or information from your non-spatial data. So imagine you had a shape file that has counties, and you have a spreadsheet that has a lot of information about the counties. You can join those two together and create a new data layer that has the geometry of all the counties and the non-spatial information from the spreadsheet. And you can take the spatial data layer and do something else to it and create non-spatial data. So it doesn't all have to be spatial. You can mix spatial and non-spatial. Okay, spatial scope is a concept that you need to keep in mind for both vector and raster models. And for vector models, there are three different scopes, spatial scopes. There's a local scope. And a local scope is where each feature only depends upon itself and the attributes that it has. So in this case, I have population density, and a local op operation is able to go into Utah and look only at Utah and determine what the population density for Utah is. So each state can have its population density calculated based upon only the values of that single feature. A neighborhood operation is where the result for a single feature depends upon the nearby features. So in this case, if you wanted to calculate how many states are adjacent to Utah, you would need to go out and look at all of the adjacent features and use the sum of the adjacent features to calculate how many states are adjacent to Utah. So this is a neighborhood operation. It depends upon things that are close to or nearby the feature that you're considering. The third type of scope is a global scope, and a global scope is where the answer for any single feature depends upon the values for all the features in your data set. So this example is the rank of total population in 1990. So Utah ranks somewhere in all of these states in population 1990, but in order to tell where Utah ranks, you need to know the populations of all of the states, not just the neighboring states or not just Utah. 
So local, neighborhood, and global are the three spatial scopes for vector data. Okay, so let's say we want to do some examples here. We'll make some sentences, some short little workflows that illustrate what you can do to the data to transform it from data to information that you might want. So let's say we have a data set that uses all the states and it has information about each state that's been joined to it, maybe from a spreadsheet or from another feature class. And you've created this map that just shows all the different states. And obviously this type of data for each state being a type of state or a name of a state is going to be what would be called nominal data. You can't compare Montana to Wyoming just based upon the names of the states. So that's nominal data and remember when you symbolize nominal data you want to use distinct colors. So this is a good map for symbolizing nominal data. Maybe it's a little bit bright in terms of the contrast of the colors but you can go back and review the module 3 cartographic coverage to kind of talk about or think about how you would make this map different if you wanted to make it look different. Okay, so let's let's make a sentence that conducts a local operation. What is the population density of Utah? So we're only interested in Utah. How can you do that local operation? Well, you're going to go through a sequence of steps or a series of steps because that's what these workflows are. So what we want to do is get the population density of Utah. So what steps would we follow? Well, we could just use the identity tool to select Utah, right in ArcMap. Select Utah, it'll pop up a box that gives us all the information that we have about Utah. And then you could get your calculator out and you could take the population 2012 field and divide it by the square mile field and that'll give you the answer. So that's a very easy workflow, a very easy sentence to do. To make it a little more difficult, what about for every state. We don't want to go through and use the identity tool and click on each one of the states and use the calculator to calculate it for each one of the states. So there's got to be a better way and ArcGIS and ArcMap give you a better way. Okay. So what are we going to do to get for all of the states the population density? Well we're going to need to add a new field to our attribute table. And we'll call that field popped in. You can right click and do uh, um, add field to your feature class and add a new field. And then we can use what's called the field calculator. The field calculator can go in and based upon the value of other fields in your feature class calculate the value of your new field. And if you haven't done this in lab already you'll be doing this in lab so it's something that's pretty easy to do once you see how to do it. Add a new field, calculate the field. This is a real common set of operations when you're doing vector analysis because a lot of the times you're going to be creating new data in order to store that data in your feature class you're going to need to add a field that will hold the data and you're going to need to calculate that values of that field. Okay so now we have the result for each one of the states we now have a number that represents the population density in terms of people per square mile. So what do you think about that map? Well, those of you that were paying attention in Module 3 might think, well, this is numeric data. And numeric data generally shouldn't be symbolized with distinct colors like this. You can see that it appears to have been classified because there are, what, one, two, three, four, five different colors. So the values have been grouped into five different groups, so it's been classified. But the colors have been assigned to each of the class to make them appear distinct. And remember when you have numeric data, the best way to symbolize things is with a single color and different levels of intensity of the single color. So probably not a very good map. Neighborhood operation. How many states are adjacent to Utah? Okay, well, how can we do this? We're only concerned with Utah. What would be the steps? Select Utah. We can do that using any one of those geometries right inside of ArcMap and just go in and select Utah. And then we can do a spatial selection. Remember a spatial selection where you can do select by location and you can pick your input, your target layer and your source layer and the spatial relationship between the target and the source. And so we can pick states and we can say select by location from states all of the features that spatial representation touch the boundary of states. And so what you'll end up getting as an output from this is a selected 
feature class that has all of the adjacent states, but in addition it'll have Utah in it. So you're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. Well, basically you're just going to have to subtract one from that in your head, and you'll know that since it's selected seven and Utah counts and it's not really adjacent to Utah, subtract one. Okay, let's expand that so that we're going to calculate that for each of the states. Hmm, how are we going to do that? We're going to follow a set of steps in a workflow. We're going to use, this case, the spatial join tool, okay? And what's the spatial join to do, tool do? It goes out and it gets attributes from a source table that are based upon some spatial re re relationship between the source table and the target table. So it's going to go out, in this case we'll tell it to go out to the states and get the sum or the count of all of the states that touch the boundary of the selected state or each of the states. And that's going to make a new feature class that'll have a new column in it that'll give us that value. So once we do that, we're going to need to add a new field because we need to get our data and store it. And instead of just doing it in our head, we're going to use the field calculator to take the join count, which is the number of states that touch that you get from doing the spatial join tool, subtract one, and that'll be our new value, the value that we need to map. And there's our map. What about this map? Is it a good map or a bad map? Well, I don't know. Would you want to symbolize that so that certain states that have a lot of adjacent states have a darker color and certain states that don't have a lot of adjacent states have a lighter color? Maybe so. And if so, that sends a message if there are states that have more adjacent states, which you would think that probably back east where the states are smaller, the average number of adjacent states might be higher than out west where the states are larger. If you were to symbolize this map with color, you might see a gradation from lighter to darker, and that would show you a pattern in your data that you could then go ahead and ask, why is it that way? And that would be the next step in an analysis you might do with this operation. Okay, let's look at a global operation. How does each state rank according to population? Hmm. How are we going to do that? We want to do it for each state. So we don't want to just calculate it for one state. And now you need to kind of start putting your thinking cap on and you think rank. How would I rank things if it wasn't a GIS? And what you would probably determine is that to rank things, you need to sort things in order, ascending or descending order. And once you've sorted them, then you can start assigning a number in a sequence. One is the highest or one is the lowest. Two, three, four, five, six, just go in order once they're sorted. But you have to sort it first. Sure enough, there's a sort tool that you can use. And the sort tool will create a new layer sorted by population. We need to save that data so that we can use it later. So we're going to need to add a field to hold that rank data that we get from the sort. And then we use the field calculator to populate the field. So this is kind of an example where I haven't showed you a tool that does sorting. But when you think about what you need to do to do your workflow, you th might think, I need to do a sort. And one of the ways you can determine whether a GIS knows how to do that is to go into the help system, and in the search function in the help system, just type in sort. And it'll come back and it'll tell you if there's a sort tool. Sure enough, there's a sort tool. It'll tell you how to use it and what it does, and you can do your GIS workflow. So those, and there you have your result, this is ranked according to population. Whether or not you would want to symbolize this according to color depends upon you. Generally, you would use a lighter color for numeric data for one level of the, spe of the range and a darker intensity of the same color for the other end of the range. And you'd be able to see maybe whether there are patterns in where population ranks higher or lower in the, across the contaminated United States. Okay, those were some quick examples of kind of simple workflows that you might imagine putting together to answer a question using data as an input, applying tools or functions or operations to that data to create an output that answers a question that you might have about the data. And you can see where the question might not only involve numbers and what's in the data, it might also involve spatial relationships in the data. Okay, next time I'll try to do an example that's a little bit more involved, so I'm going to maybe make a paragraph instead of a short sentence, and we'll walk through how you might do a workflow for a little bit more complicated problem. So that'll be in the next video.